Hello, and thank you for your interest in the Landmarks of American History and Culture grant program offered by the National Endowment for the Humanities. My name is Jason Harshman, a program officer in the Division of Education Programs, and along with program analyst Mary M. Moese, we serve as the lead staff for the Landmarks program. This recording is designed to provide examples and explanation in support of the Notice of Funding Opportunity Guidelines available at the NEH page you see here. These guidelines are for applicants interested in leading a Landmarks Professional Development Workshop during 2024 and replace previously posted requirements from previous grant cycles. New and returning applicants must use these guidelines when forming and submitting their new applications. If you have not yet downloaded the guidelines, they are available below this video on the NEH Landmarks page, along with sample applications from previously awarded programs, a sample budget justification document, and other materials that will be addressed in this video. This recording is not a replacement for the specific requirements laid out in the guidelines, as this video does not cover all aspects of the guidelines. When questions arise, you should first reference the guidelines and can email us at landmarks at neh.gov with questions. Please know that in addition to the sample narratives and this webinar recording, NEH Division of Education program staff are available to answer questions at any time. We'll hold a live question and answer session on December 6, 2022, and review drafts submitted by December 15, 2022. I will discuss these opportunities further near the conclusion of this recording. The Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO for short, is also known as the guidelines for the grant program. This PDF may appear to be a long, dense document, so I want to highlight a few pages that can help you with the big picture before we move into the components that make up the whole document. All applicants should read the NOFO guidelines in their entirety to ensure you address all requirements. Page 10 provides a table that includes all of the required pieces for the application that need to be submitted. This also includes the required naming conventions when saving and uploading files. The main part of the application is known as the narrative. What you need to address in your narrative begins on page 10, and there are seven parts to the narrative. Information for how to lay out your budget begins on page 13. Landmarks grants provide up to $190,000 per project. We recommend meeting with a grant administrator or research office staff member at your institution at the start of this process, as they may have experience applying for NEH grants, or if this is the first time, they may have questions about how to complete this form. An explanation for all application components, including the attachments required in addition to the narrative, begins on page 23. Think of this as the checklist to make sure you have everything you need before you upload. The information provided on page 23 tells you exactly what you need to know and what you need to do to submit a complete application. And lastly, you will find the review criteria on page 32. It is always good to begin with the end in mind, so we provide you with the exact criteria reviewers use when evaluating applications. A more detailed discussion of each of these items, the narrative, the attachments, and the evaluation criteria is available in the NOFO and addressed throughout this recording. So what is the Landmarks program about? Landmarks Professional Development Workshops can be designed around a variety of humanities topics and are hosted at a range of sites across the United States and its jurisdictions. From waterways to archives, museums and national parks, as well as archives, neighborhoods, historic homes, churches and cemeteries to name a few sites, Landmarks programs engage participants in the study of a place from multiple perspectives and can explore that place as it has changed over time. Project teams bring together methods and scholarship used by historians, anthropologists, archivists, librarians, and museum educators, to name a few, to engage K-12 educators, higher education faculty, and humanities professionals in deep study of topics that blend history, civics, literature, the arts, environmental studies, geography, architecture, archaeology, and place-based pedagogy. A significant outcome of a Landmarks workshop is the development of education materials that enhance how participants teach humanities using a place-based approach. For K-12 programs, this may include participants developing curricular resources, 
a new student research project that requires exploration of local or state history, or designing learning activities outside of a classroom that could involve monuments, markers, or a more general study of local history and culture. Programs for higher education and humanities professionals may include opportunities to revise syllabi to include experiential learning opportunities with community organizations, how to conduct oral histories, designing a local history lecture series, or developing a collaborative project between faculty and local libraries, museums, or historical societies, to name just a few. There are new opportunities offered with this grant cycle that we want to bring to your attention. First, as noted, the Landmarks program now supports two types of professional development programs. We continue to support workshops designed for K-12 educators and now support workshops designed for higher education faculty, staff, and advanced graduate students, as well as humanities professionals. Specifics related to audience and eligibility are addressed later in this webinar and detailed on page two and three of the guidelines. A second change has to do with previously awarded projects looking to apply again. If you have run a Landmarks program previously, you are no longer required to change the focus topic of your project in order to be eligible to apply in successive years. The guidelines include questions you must respond to within the narrative regarding changes made based on your previous program and previously run Landmarks projects must submit unaltered participant evaluations with their application. Project teams can now determine how many participants they would invite based on the range provided rather than a requirement that all projects host 36 participants per week. This is also detailed on pages two to three of the guidelines and later in this recording. One other significant change has to do with the length of the award period. Landmarks grants now have a period of performance of 15 months instead of 24 months, since all projects are offered in the same calendar year. Landmarks workshops commonly bring together a diverse array of humanities educators from across multiple subject areas and professions. While you might have a particular audience in mind, Landmarks workshops must be open to all eligible applicants. Workshops designed for K-12 educators are attended by social studies, literature, and arts educators, and can include STEM educators, library specialists, and museum educators if the applicants demonstrate why attending your program would have a significant impact on how they transfer place-based humanities concepts and skills to the educational settings they work in. Workshops for higher ed faculty and humanities professionals would also attract participants from across disciplines and careers. Who might be interested in a Landmarks workshop centered around the study of a cultural landscape that examines scholarship on spatial humanities and sessions on developing experiential learning in an undergraduate public history course? What opportunities could a Landmarks workshop designed to bring together museum education faculty and museum educators foster? Or what about a workshop that explores sites of historical and cultural significance through the lens of environmental humanities for faculty in literature, history, and American studies? No matter K through 12 or higher ed, having participants from an array of subject areas can make for dynamic conversations and a much wider dissemination of learning in educational settings. How are Landmarks programs structured? NEH has some requirements, and individual project teams have choices for how and when they would offer a Landmarks workshop. This information is included on pages two to three of the guidelines. Landmarks workshops run for two separate weeks for two different groups of participants during the same year. A typical Landmarks residential program runs for five to seven days. For example, you might begin with a welcome event on a Sunday evening at the host site and then run your workshop sessions through that Friday night. Or participants could arrive on a Sunday with the workshop scheduled to run from Monday through Saturday. Your project team will determine the days and the dates for the two weeks of your workshops and must include those in your application. While a Landmarks project runs for two separate weeks for two different groups of participants, the presentations, readings, site visits, and activities are fundamentally the same. 
Specific questions and ideas regarding the day-to-day -day schedule of a workshop are addressed later in this video. Project teams can also choose the format for their workshop. We support residential or in-person programs, and a residential program means all participants attend in-person for the duration of the workshop at the host site. Participants who complete the residential program requirements receive a taxable stipend of $1,300. Landmarks programs can also be designed to offer a fully online experience. A virtual workshop means all participants attend for the duration of the session using an online platform. This can include synchronous and asynchronous sessions. Participants who complete the virtual program requirements receive a taxable stipend of $650. Landmarks applicants may also design a combined format program. A combined format program means all participants attend a portion of the pro project online and a portion of the project at the host site. Online and residential sessions occur at different times, but participants attend the same format simultaneously. Your project team can decide how many participants you would invite to participate for each week. Programs designed specifically for K-12 educators can be for 30 to 36 individuals each week for a total of 60 to 72 per program. If your workshop is designed for higher education faculty and or humanities professionals, you can set the number of spots available for between 20 to 24 per week for 40 to 48 participants total. Here are two examples that can be used for a Landmarks workshop. These are examples only, so keep in mind that K through 12 and higher education programs can be offered as residential, virtual, or combined format workshops. Each of these examples include a residential component, which means participants would each receive a stipend of $1,300 to help offset costs for attending. Only a completely virtual program has a stipend of $650. Note these examples include specific dates for the residential components. You will also see that the example to the right for a combined format program identifies when the online sessions would be held in addition to the in-person meetings. Regardless of the topic, host site, or audience, your Landmarks project must be offered for two separate sessions for two different groups of participants during the same calendar year, most likely during the same summer season. The dates and format, as well as, review, re, as well as reviewing applicants to determine who would attend, is up to your project team. As we cover specifics within the guidelines, I will offer examples and questions to consider as you develop your application. Our Landmarks landing page offers sample narratives from some of the projects you see here, and a sample budget justification to inform how you structure your budget. We think you will find these helpful as you respond to the required prompts included in the guidelines and encourage you to read them alongside the evaluation criteria to see how applications cover the requirements. Please know these are just examples and should not be interpreted as templates for future applications. Since this is the first year Landmarks programs can be offered for higher education and humanities professionals, we do not have sample applications to offer for those programs specifically. We believe you will find the sample applications provided, however, helpful as you develop your application. So who can apply to lead a Landmarks program? NEH Landmarks grants are made to institutions and organizations rather than individuals, though individuals serve as the project directors. The guidelines spell out who is eligible to lead and attend a Landmarks program on pages five and six. Since this video is about leading a workshop, I will focus on that element of the eligibility requirements. Individuals at two and four year colleges and universities, nonprofit organizations, state or local government agencies, and Native American tribal governments are all eligible to apply to lead a Landmarks workshop. It is often the case that two faculty members at the same or different institutions co-direct a project, or a faculty member will collaborate with a local organization leader on a project. Both are eligible to lead, but only one institution can serve as the award recipient. 
NEH does not make awards to other federal entities and may not award grants to non-federal entities whose projects are so closely intertwined that the project takes on characteristic of that federal entity's own authorized activities. This is known as entwinement and addressed on page 7 of the guidelines. For example, if you are planning to visit a national park or arrange to have an employee of the National Park Service give a presentation or site tour, their involvement would need to be part of their regular job responsibilities, and they cannot be compensated for their participation on the NEH workshop. NEH funds cannot be used to pay another federal employee, in this case, a National Park Service employee, for work they are already paid to do as a federal employee, that is, provide educational services to the public. Special tours or activities beyond their regular duties and workday are not allowed. If you are unsure about the involvement of a federal entity for your project, please contact us to discuss the specifics. The main components of the narrative begin on page 10 of the guidelines. Letters A through G constitute the seven sections of the application narrative that, in total, should be no more than 10 single space pages with one inch margins and a font size no smaller than 11. If you are a returning project, your narrative maximum is 12 pages since you are required to address additional questions as noted in each section. Reviewing the sample narratives provided at the NEH Landmarks website will help you see how past projects have addressed these sections and you are invited to contact a Division of Education program staff member at any point when composing your application to discuss questions or go over draft materials. Again, our email is landmarks at neh.gov. Each section of the narrative includes two important parts. First, you will find the requirements for each section in the form of a bulleted list. Each section of the narrative then has a corresponding review criterion available on page 32 of this same document. This is the same review criteria used during the review and recommendation process, so please attend to these points and questions thoroughly when composing your application. Each application begins with the nature of the request that can be approached as a project abstract. There are three bullet points to address in this one paragraph section and it does not require elaboration beyond those points. The first and most important aspect of the review criteria is the intellectual content and significance of your project. Here you will explain in a clear manner, free of discipline-specific jargon, what makes the combination of the topics and places to be studied a compelling humanities project. Here you will lay out for reviewers the foundational scholarship and compelling questions, perspectives, and approaches that would make this a project of interest to the intended audience. Since your application requires inclusion of a reading list, you may want to reference specific pieces included on that list in this section. A few questions to consider when composing the intellectual content and significance section. Why is this a significant topic to be studied? Or, how do the approaches you propose to take bring to light marginalized or typically underdeveloped aspects of a topic and the sites you will include? What new scholarship may be available? And how would this provide participants with new understandings of topics and sites within their study of U.S. history and culture? How would studying the collection of sites included as part of your workshop inform one's understanding of a topic? and how they approach teaching similar topics and concepts in their own local area. In short, the intellectual content and significance section should address why this topic, why here, and why now. You are required to not only show why the compelling intellectual significance of the Landmarks project you have designed would appeal to the designated audiences, but also how the workshop would inform their work as educators. Participants regularly praise NEH professional development programs for the scholarly experience they provide, as well as the impact these programs have on their teaching and research. 
Who do you envision as your target audience? As noted earlier, Landmark's projects are attended by educators across the humanities and beyond, meaning history, literature, and art educators are often learning side by side with STEM teachers, librarians, and other faculty across and beyond the humanities. Keeping in mind that Landmark's projects typically offer interdisciplinary learning opportunities as they bring the study of history, literature, art, language, music, geography, and more together, why would the approaches or methods your workshop would take when studying these topics and sites be of relevance to their work? As a Landmarks workshop, how would your project support and educate participants on how to engage their own students in place-based teaching and learning within the humanities? For projects looking to welcome a K-12 audience, familiarity with state and national standards where your project topic fits into K-12 curricula, and if or why the approaches, perspectives, and expertise offered within your program would address a lack within or expand upon current classroom practices are all important questions to address when completing this section. Collaboration with the required education specialists that will be part of your workshop on this section is particularly important. Projects designed for faculty and staff in higher education and or humanities professionals should think about innovative activities happening in college classrooms or at libraries, museums, and other sites for public humanities. Why would participants find this program of interest and relevant to current work in their respective fields? What's happening in museum studies and museum education that this workshop intends to address and therefore would attract professionals to this workshop? Would your workshop include sessions on designing experiential learning activities, how to conduct oral histories, or what to consider when designing a walking or digital tour of a neighborhood or landscape? All of these are possible activities to include in your workshop and need to be detailed as to why they are relevant and would have impact on the humanities and place-based teaching for those audiences. No matter your audience, this section of the application needs to illustrate how your program would support participants in building a bridge from what they do at the sites you visit during the workshop and how they engage in similar methods and conceptual approaches in their own local education settings. There are three requirements within the application that when perceived and addressed as similar could lead to an underdeveloped application. The program of study is the only one addressed within the body of the narrative. The workshop schedule and the project work plan are submitted as attachments. Each of these pieces of the application address different but interconnected pieces of information to show reviewers how you plan to conceptualize and facilitate your Landmarks project. I will address each of these in more detail. The program of study is a requirement within the narrative and appears on page 11 of the guidelines. This section addresses what participants would study, what scholars would discuss, and what your site-based experiences would address. Since you would provide a day-to-day -day schedule as one of the attachments, you want to use this section as an explanation of the conceptual design and intentional sequencing for why and how the week unfolds. Think of the program of study as triangulating the content, the sites, and the classroom application. What are the underlying concepts that emerge from the intellectual significance that serve as the glue across the program? Would you have an overarching essential question for the program or a compelling question or two for each day to ground the discussions? How would readings and lectures lead to discussion? What is happening at the sites when you visit them? How are these activities connected? How would the education specialists engage with participants? What would curricular work time entail? Will you place people together in groups, give them individual work time, or set up a kind of office hours approach where members of the project staff meet with individual participants? You may also consider how the focus of Tuesday would build upon Monday and inform what happens later in the week. Spending time in your application to detail one full day as a model for how other days of the program would unfold can be a helpful approach to showing reviewers 
the conceptual underlying of your program of study. Since your schedule will show reviewers what participants would do, your program of study tells them why. Here's where speaking with a Division of Education program staff member can be helpful as you determine the what, where, when, and how of your program. The work plan is a required attachment. This means it does not appear in the narrative of your application, but is required for the application as a whole. There is no page limit for the work plan. The work plan is about your team and how you would work between the start of the grant through the end of your Landmarks program. Points to consider are included on page 12 of the guidelines. Questions to consider when designing your work plan include, who would be responsible for what? Who would make arrangements with the presenters? Who would oversee housing if you are running a residential program? Who would work to develop digital materials such as a site tour or record a lecture for a virtual program? Who would serve on the application review team? And so on. The work plan is the behind the scenes schedule for per putting the project together. This is typically organized on a month by month basis from the start of the award to delivery of the final reports. Details within the work plan help reviewers evaluate the feasibility of executing the project you have designed. The guidelines include NEH required dates on page 27 to help you design your work plan. These are not the only dates and activities that would appear in your work plan, but serve as guideposts as you would add dates and activities specific to your project to complete the work plan. The schedule is what participants, presenters, and project team members would do for the duration of your Landmarks workshop. There is no page limit or format requirement for the schedule. Would there be a welcome gathering on the first day? What time would the first day begin? Who would be presenting? What would the topic be and what would participants have been required to read or prepare in advance? The schedule is meant to show reviewers how the days would be spent. It is the doing of the program of study. If you are planning a virtual or combined format project, it is important to keep time zone differences in mind when scheduling synchronous online sessions. The schedule for a combined format program should include dates for all meetings and consider potential teaching schedules for sessions that occur outside of the summer meetings. For example, if you plan to hold a meeting in October, what might be happening in K-12 educational settings or on higher education campuses that could cause difficulty for people to attend. Virtual programs can combine synchronous and asynchronous sessions and could have later start and end times for each day compared to a residential program. Virtual programs may also consider sessions outside of the summer session in the interest of supporting educators during the school year. Points to consider when organizing your schedule can be found on page 25 and a sample schedule is available at the NEH Landmarks page. The project director is typically a humanities specialist and there can be one or more co-directors for your project. While many Landmarks project directors and co-directors work in higher education, this is not a requirement. Project directors and co-directors do not need to possess a terminal degree or be college or university faculty members in the humanities. University faculty, executive directors of an organization, educational staff at, an, at a historic home, museum staff, and more are all eligible to apply to lead a Landmarks workshop. Projects designed for K-12 educators are required to include a K-12 education specialist on their planning and program delivery team. This person may be a curriculum supervisor for a school district, a teacher education faculty member at a local university or college, a museum education specialist, or a current classroom teacher with experience facilitating professional learning workshops. The role the education specialist would play in planning and during the workshop needs to be clearly addressed in the project narrative, the schedule, and the work plan. The presenters you invite to be part of the program may possess expertise in a range of areas related to your central topic and come from a variety of institution types. 
professors, authors, artists, filmmakers, independent scholars, education staff at a museum, and local community members and organization leaders with direct experience and knowledge of an event or place under study within your workshop can all be part of the presenters who participants learn from. Each project must have a grant administrator who is not the proposed project director or co-project director. Your institution or organization may have a grant specialist office or equivalent where someone who would serve in this capacity works. A grant administrator is responsible for requesting and distributing grant funds, filing reports, and completing other required correspondence with NEH. All projects are required to have a replacement project director should something unexpected require the project director to step away. And so having a co-director familiar with all parts of the project makes this easier. The replacement director must be a co-project director, or if there is no co-director, someone already involved with the project. It is important to secure letters of commitment from project presenters, from people representing sites such as libraries, parks, or historic homes that you will visit, and from the host institution to show that there is a commitment to the project that you have outlined and to serving as the host institution for a Landmarks workshop. Please be sure to confer with the guidelines for more specifics regarding what should be included in a letter of commitment and how to submit that as part of your application. If funded, all Landmarks projects are required to design a website that would be used to advertise the workshop, serve as a place for potential applicants to learn about your program, and access materials to apply to attend. Your website is included as one of the required NEH dates that you will include in your work plan. We recommend looking at the list of past Landmarks projects available at the NEH website to see what these entail. You can also contact NEH Landmarks staff about the website design if you would like to get a better sense of what these examples include. Your application needs to address how your team would promote your program to recruit individuals relevant to your intended audiences from across the country. For K-12 programs, how would you reach a wide range of educators who work in public, private, independent, or as homeschool providers? Keep in mind points made at the beginning of this video about the interdisciplinary nature of Landmarks programs and the value of building a diverse applicant pool open to educators across the country and its jurisdictions. Programs designed for higher education and humanities professionals will want to think about the various networks you can use to reach potential applicants. What specific listservs, conferences, social media accounts, or organizations would you want to contact? How might you use email, online bulletin board and announcement spaces, or other means of communicating with related audiences. Be sure your application names specific examples to show reviewers what you have in mind and why. A few questions to consider, no matter your intended audience. How will you use social media, conferences, and other networks to recruit? Are there listservs that you would utilize, and if so, which ones? Do your proposed partner sites, a museum, a historic home, archive, or library, have ways of advertising and recruiting to reach potential applicants? Some projects even create short videos about the projects with images of sites to be visited and share those via social media to help attract applicants. Additionally, we ask you to develop a plan for how your work and the work of those who participate in your program would be shared beyond the, the primary audience. This is known as dissemination. Since the project is designed for a national audience, what might your project team do after the program formally ends to reach local or regional educators? If you plan to keep in touch with participants formally or informally, be sure to provide a clear plan for how that would happen. When it comes to dissemination, you should consider how you might reach a broader academic or professional audience or educators at the K-12 schooling levels beyond those who attended your program.
as noted at the outset of this video and detailed in the guidelines, in addition to the narrative, there are other attachments that must be included when you submit your application. Each of these are referenced in the table on page 10, and the table on page 10 includes the naming conventions you must use when uploading your application. If you decide to submit a draft for review, you can include any of these attachments at any point of completion for feedback. Or in addition to submitting a draft of your narrative, you can arrange for a phone conversation or video conference with NEH staff to go over any part of the application requirements prior to submitting. The review criteria for all Landmarks applications is available on pages 32 to 33. We encourage you to review the questions provided, noting that if you are a returning project, there are additional questions that you must respond to to show how evaluations, feedback, and reflections on past projects are informing changes to the project you are proposing this time. This is the same review criteria that is used during the panel review process and recommendation process. So we have found that it is helpful to ask someone who is not familiar with your project to look at the criteria when reviewing your application and offering feedback. Sometimes these, this type of review from someone who, who is not familiar with what you have put together can identify pieces that you may want to elaborate on or perhaps have not addressed at all. Provided on pages 31 through 32 is a list of what is, cannot be funded during a Landmarks program by NEH. Please keep in mind that Landmarks programs cannot advocate a particular position on a political issue, make space for participants to carry out actions that advocate a particular point of view in their classrooms, or present a program that leans heavily toward one interpretation of an historical event or era. Reading lists, speakers, and other presenters would help to create a learning environment in which participants are able to investigate sources and draw conclusions on their own is imperative. During the review process, reviewers may ask the extent to which your project has preserved open inquiry to avoid any type of advocacy or social activism in relation to the project. The NEH supports the study of art history and music, but programs that focus on the creative arts and the production of art are ineligible. NEH funds cannot be used for tuition remission for graduate students who may serve on the project team, and NEH does not fund meals or social gatherings. However, you can budget funds for items that may not be easily accessible due to the length of a trip or the location of a site. This means that you could budget for refreshments such as bottles of water or small snacks, or depending on where you will travel on a given day, if you anticipate that it would be difficult to access meals, you can budget for box lunches that would be provided either at the site or on a bus to get to or from that site. When it comes time to apply, it is important that you make sure that you have confirmed your SAM registration is current and that you verify your access to grants.gov. Remember you are applying as an institution, so you would be using your institution's account information. If you don't know this information, be sure to check with a grants administrator or equivalent staff at your institution as soon as possible. We will not accept late applications, and registration in these two systems is part of the application process. If you are planning to apply, we recommend that you begin this process now, as it can often take a while for this to be confirmed. Additionally, your institution may require additional review time, so while your application is due to NEH by February 1, 2023, you may need to submit it to your institutional grant administrator for review in advance of that date to ensure it is uploaded on time. The application window for the 
Landmarks of American History and Culture Grant Program opened on November 4th, 2022, and will remain open until February 1st, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. A live Q&A with NEH staff will be held on December 6, 2022 at noon Eastern time. This session will include a short formal program at the start, followed by a question and answer format with those who attend. We will be joined by staff from our Office of Grant Management, so your institutional grant administrator is encouraged to attend as well. The link to attend this meeting is available on the second page of the Notice of Funding Opportunity Guidelines at the Landmarks page and will be shared out by the Division of Education Program Twitter account. If you have difficulty locating this, please email us at landmarks at neh.gov and we can provide that link to you directly. That meeting will be held using Microsoft Teams. Drafts are optional and can be completed in the most efficient format that works for you. Of course, the more complete, the more helpful the feedback. We aim to turn these drafts around as quickly as possible, and it is likely that if a draft is turned in by the due date of December 15th, 2022, you can expect to receive a response before January 11th, 2023. Again, drafts are optional, and you do not need to submit a complete application to receive feedback. Your draft can be at any point of completion. If you think it would be better to talk with someone about questions you have, please reach out to schedule a call. Instructions for how to submit your application through grants.gov are provided in the Notice of Funding. Only complete applications submitted by the deadline of February 1, 2023 will be reviewed. The National Council on the Humanities will meet in July of 2023 to discuss those applications that are recommended by the review panels that would meet in April 2023. On average, we have awarded 14 grants a year through this program, but please know we do not have a ceiling, nor do we have a set number of applications in mind. All applications are evaluated individually against the criteria and move forward based on those recommendations. We plan to notify award recipients in August 2023, and grants begin in October 2023 for summer 2024. If you would like a program officer in the Division of Education to review a draft, or if you would like to speak with us about any question you have regarding the Landmarks program, you can contact us at landmarks at neh.gov, and we will meet with you to discuss your project at any point, including drafts feedback once it's been received. We look forward to hearing from you and hopefully working with you on a program of your own. Thank you for your time and for your interest in the NEH's Landmarks of American History and Culture Grants Program.